crowd. All right. Hey, Karen. Hi, Dr. Zuniga. How are you doing today on Friday? I am great. I'm looking <laughs> forward to chatting today and telling you a little bit about anxiety. Fantastic. Well, I know we're really happy to have you here. You're an expert in your field. And so I'd like to introduce our audience and tell them a little bit about you. You've been a psychotherapist for over 20 years, and you're really a true cognitive behavioral therapist, um, also known as CBT. And um, your, your clinical knowledge has actually been recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is also known as the DSM-5, as well as professional journals. Um, I actually know that you received your bachelor's degree in political science with an emphasis in law and um, psychology, and then you got your master's degree in social work from the University of Minnesota. Um, you are in San Diego, California right now where you have a lovely private practice and um, I know you're just such a strong advocate for current and former foster youth, and you're a foster parent yourself. <laughs> well, I was until I adopted, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're an adoptive parent, so that's good. Yeah, well, thanks for the introduction. Of course. Thanks for the introduction. <clears throat> so today, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, well, today is geared towards therapists, but any anybody can glean information from this, and I think they're going to find it helpful. Uh, I encourage anybody who has any questions to reach out, and we can chat a little bit, or, or you could reach out to Dr. Zinnick as well, and um, you know she can discuss how to reach me. So. Let's get started. I am so excited to be here. Anxiety is my absolute favorite thing to talk about. Uh, I love working with people with anxiety. I also want to emphasize that a lot of times people with anxiety can be quite frustrated with themselves, be quite frustrated with the situation that they're in, but there are a lot of strengths that people with anxiety carry. One thing that's really important to know is that people with anxiety worry about the future or we can, but they also think about the future. And so this future orientation, when you have it can be really useful. Today, we're gonna to talk about when it isn't so useful, when it turns into true anxiety disorders, things that get in the way of your functioning. <clears throat> so, we know right now, actually, before we get started, I'm going to share something with you. Oops, can you, can you, right now, the participant screen sharing is disabled. Can you allow me to share something? Yeah, let me. Okay, and in the meantime, if everybody can get something to write on, because I'm going to have you do some, some work here. I think if I make you host, then you can screen share, right? I believe so. That's what I'm going to do. Super. Okay, let's see here. All right. This is good. It gives some people time to grab something to write on. All right. Okay. Does everybody see this? Yes. The situations. As a practitioner, I draw this up for each individual. And I was telling Rosalie earlier that this morning I was trying to create this beautiful whiteboard presentation of, of this chart. And then I was having this really hard time. And then I said, you know, why am I doing this? Why don't I show you what I do? There is a reason, even though I do this all the time that I don't have a template for it. 
And it's because perfectionism runs rampant in folks with anxiety. And so one thing as a practitioner we want to do is we want to show good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. Good enough. I have terrible handwriting. I joke about it. I say, eh, it's good enough. And so I want others to see that you don't have to be perfect to get the information you need. So I encourage you to write this down. And in a couple minutes, I'm going to take this off the screen share and we're going to move forward. So as you'll notice on here, there's situations, you can also write trigger, physical and emotional feelings, because they're divided into two things, thoughts and behaviors. And those three, those four things are typically the crux of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, I add biology for a reason. A lot of great, new, exciting information about functional MRIs are coming out. And what's so exciting about it is they can actually measure brain activity. They can see neural pathways. Um, we know now, you know, they used to think that people's brains are pretty solidified around like 16 years old. That is not true. Um, if you've heard the term neuroplasticity, people's brains change and the neural pathways can change until you die. You can be 80 and now they know that the neural pathways can change and you can, you can use cognitive behavioral therapy to, to do that, to change the way you think and your responses come into play. We will talk about biology more in a little bit, but I want to emphasize biology is an important part of looking at anxiety. Okay. So let's talk about COVID and some stressors. And I'm going to put Dr. Zuniga in the hot seat today because um, I can't see anybody else. But if anybody is there and they want to say anything, I know um, Rosalie's available to, to share with me if there's anybody saying anything on Facebook or any chat since I can't see it. But let's talk about COVID. Can you give me, Rosalie, a template of maybe somebody who would come into the office because they're having anxiety because of COVID and these life transitions? Yeah. Um, so anxiety about whether or not things will ever go back to the way, to the way. Okay. Go back to normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And use the term anxiety. All right. Let's pretend you're that person. All right. And you're sitting there thinking about, well, every, will anything ever come back? What else are you thinking? Oh, that's what else is going on? Oh, um, well, what if it never goes back? To the way it was. What if it never goes back? Okay, what if it does never go back? And so as you're having these thoughts, what's going on? I'm getting scared. Nervous. Okay. Um, I start tapping my leg. Me feel better to do that. <laughs> okay, so getting rid of some energy, some physical energy in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to think about it because it's too hard. And sometimes people have 
body sensations that come along with thinking about things that are scary or nerve wracking to them. What do you think? Do you have any? Um, I tend to perspire or in my hands get clammy. Um, and even though I'm perspiring, but I, I'm still cold. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And then I just, I can't, I find myself like not breathing normally. Like I'll probably just hold my breath a little bit more frequently. Okay. I will tell you one thing that happens to me when I hold my breath. I don't know if it happens to you or not. My chest starts to get a little tight and heavy. I don't know if that happens to you. Does it happen to you? Yeah, that happens too. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. And so when you start going into what if, what if things don't change? What if things don't change? What if they never go back? What do you picture? Uh, I just kind of feel like, well, then now I have to create this new way of doing things. And it just seems so overwhelming because it's like, where do I start? Okay. Good. That's good. Okay. So I'm going to show you what I wrote. It's going to take just a second. And I will tell you, have you ever had a client that when they sit in your chair for the first time, they haven't spoken to you before they go, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start when I'm telling you something. You hear that a lot? I sure do. Okay. I love this because you're helping them organize their thoughts. So you're going to break this down. You're going to help them feel more in control. You're dissecting this for them. And this, what I did is this is my way of taking notes. You will use this as you carry on through your sessions. Um, son of a gun. All these technical issues. Okay. Let me try one more time. And if not, I can just text myself this. Um, nope. Okay. That's okay. I'll just text it. So if you have time right now, what I'd like you to do is write down what you heard, I should have asked you to do this earlier and I forgot, with that chart that you wrote, I was gonna ask people as they listen to you to try and write these things down themselves in there. So um, while I'm transferring this over, why don't you all try to do that? Okay. And I always use their own language, their own language when I can. So fill in the blanks with what I said. Mm -hmm. Fill in the blanks with what you what I said, or what you said. Okay, so I know that there are 
people who don't like to write during session, don't like taking notes. In my experience, I've never had anybody who doesn't mind, especially when they get something like this afterwards. And so in these thoughts, you'll notice that I used Rosalie's thoughts verbatim. Very important, because this is theirs. This is an individualized template. I know the template, but they know their specific feelings and thoughts and behaviors. And so then what I do is I give this to them and I say, hey, this is a work in progress. Because again, one of the things that people with anxiety don't like is ambiguity, but I'm helping them get used to ambiguous things. And, you know, the process of therapy is distinct and structured, yet it's a process of discovery and curiosity. And so so I want to carry that along. And I'm like, hey, this isn't everything. This is just a process. But I just want to know if I'm on the right track. Is this correct? Is there anything you'd add or take away? And people love this. They'll go, no, this is right. Okay. So you're already providing psychoeducation as to how this works. Mm -hmm. Right? So now, can you see my mouse? Yes. Oh, super. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is provide a little bit more psychoeducation. As you can see, I wrote down wolf, bunny, fight, flight, freeze. Right, and see how they're all correlated. This is where biology comes in. So pretend you're a bunny in the woods, right? You're hopping along. And in the past, you saw your bunny friend get eaten by a wolf right? Was not good. You know, you couldn't take a wolf down if you saw him. But you're hopping through the woods and lo and behold, what do you see? A wolf. And so if any of us have been driving down the road and see a police car with its lights turn on behind us, or you've had a close call in the car, or um, somebody is just chewing you out and your deer in the headlights, what happens to your body? Freeze. You freeze. <laughs> yes. How does your body feel? Oh, scared. But freeze is good. Yeah, scared. Um, skip a breath. <laughs> skip a breath. Good. Yes. Um, I tense up. Tense up. Super. So all these things, the blood is, those are signs that, you know, same with perspiration, being cold, holding your breath, being clammy. That happens because the blood is going to the essential organs, which in this case, and in all cases, when your body says, oh, danger, real or not, real or not, the blood rushes to the limbs. So. Bunny's like, oh my gosh, wolf, blood rushes to the limbs, runs into a log. And if any of you have pets, you have probably, I mean, even if you don't, have probably stepped on your dog's paw or your cat's tail mm -hmm. and they yelp dramatically. And five seconds later, they're just fine, but you feel like a complete jerk, right? Yeah. That is a regulated autonomic nervous system, right? They say, oh, that's just, you know, a person that accidentally stepped on my paw or stepped on my paw, but no more danger now. So that's a mammal brain. When we're in danger and our limbs are just ready to run, 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 that's reptile brain. But when we're in mammal brain, we're like, okay, cool. Besides human brain. Uh, well, any other mammal besides humans do this. Okay, there's there's no other stimuli around. I'm cool. So it's in the it's in the lock now. However, if the hu if that bunny had a human brain, it would start thinking, oh my gosh, will that wolf ever leave? Will this ever go back to normal? What if this 
does it? What if I'm stuck in here forever? I have to always look for danger from now on. Um, what do I even do? I can't even prioritize what I'm doing next because I'm so terrified, right? And so you see how those thoughts are there? Because other mammals besides humans are feelings, behaviors, biology. Humans have these thoughts. And if you have these thoughts, it keeps you stuck in reptile brain. And reptile brain is just about survival, safe, danger, safe, danger, safe, danger. And so when you're in reptile brain, you can't prioritize. You have tunnel vision. You're irritable. Because if somebody's like, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee, you're like, hey, a wolf is chasing me. What are you talking about? I'm not going to go have a cup of coffee. I'm busy with the wolf. So these thoughts, the brain doesn't know. The reptile brain does not know the difference between a thought and reality. And so what happens is you get stuck in fight, flight, freeze because you're having these thoughts. Now, the other thing that happens is when the blood, and like I talked about the functional MRIs, one thing they've learned is that when the blood goes to these essential organs and goes away from the non-essential organs, guess what part of the brain is a non-essential organ? The prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is what helps you prioritize, what helps you think rationally, helps you make judgments, help you think critically. If you've ever been stressed out and tried to read a book or do a crossword puzzle, not particularly easy to do. You know, when I have people who come in, they're like, I can't concentrate on anything. Well, no doubt, because there's no blood or there's a very limited amount of blood going to that prefrontal cortex, oh, okay. right? And so the goal is to, I mean, we we can talk about panic and extreme anxiety on one end, but really the goal is to continually re-engage that prefrontal cortex so that you can be more reasonable, right? Yes. And so in cognitive therapy, we're looking at the thoughts. Any questions so far? This is really great. I love how just thorough your explanations are, and I'm following you all the way. Okay, <laughs> great, great. Please let me know if there's any clarifications that need to be done or any thoughts you have. Now, under the biology, that little rectangle, I do ask them if they have family members, who, like biological family members who had anxiety, and I write it under there because there's a strong genetic predisposition for anxiety, if somebody in their family has an anxiety-based disorder, OCD, anything like that, just so you know. So what we're gonna do is under thoughts, I also want you to write future thoughts, future orientation. Okay. Catastrophization. And then there was another one and I forgot what it was. So it'll come back. <laughs> so, but I will tell you, and I know that you work with mostly women who um, are raising children, perfectionism and guilt run the show a yes. lot of times. And if people think they have to be perfect, that will engage the reptile brain. That will make black and white thinking happen. And babies can feel it. And, and that is out of my scope, but Rosalie probably knows and a lot of your practitioners probably know that, that, is, that that's part of it. So to decrease perfectionism, you want to address the cognitions and you wanna, you wanna calm the body. So perfectionism is a biggie. So just thinking about your clients. All right, so. What we're gonna do is worst case scenario, okay? And I'm gonna do 
a worst case scenario with Rosalie and if um, the worst case scenario and then maybe a second one, depending if we don't get to one of the topics that we're going to discuss. So, Rosalie. Yes. Let's talk about where your thoughts go when. Oh, by the way, avoidance is the trademark of anxiety. <laughs> I forgot to say that. And so stop thinking about it. Don't think about it. And when you tell yourself that, don't think about the color red, what happens? <laughs> um, right? Right? And so what happens is your adrenaline increases and then you get stuck in that fight or flight again. So allowing yourself to examine these thoughts and break them down is extremely useful. Also, uh, Christine Podesky, who wrote Mind Over Mood, um, she has a second edition out. And one thing that she is saying, and I completely believe it, and a lot of uh, a lot of new research with obsessive compulsive disorder and other anxiety-based disorders are saying what we want to focus on is even if you have <coughs> negative feelings, because a lot of this is fear of feelings, you're going to be able to handle it. And so, yes, we can address COVID in itself, but what happens when their child gets pneumonia, right? So what we wanna do is give them a battery of skills that they can generalize and apply at other times. And so one thing that you wanna to communicate to your clients, so it has longitudinal value, not just situational, is that they can handle the feelings. Mm -hmm. They can handle it, okay? So, Rosalie, back to you. Sorry, I jumped around. Let's talk about worst case scenario. What if what? What are some of those really scary things you're thinking about that you've been avoiding thinking about? Well, um, what if kids are never gonna go back to school? Okay. What if kids are never gonna go back to school? That's probably a pretty common thought. What if kids don't go back to school? And let's break it down to the steps that it, where it would go, the steps it takes to get there. They can never go back to school. Well, if they never go back to school, then that means they're at home. And then what? They're at home, then what? And then it is challenging for parents to have children at home. <laughs> yeah, it is. And the worst case scenario, we are talking catastrophe. Worst so, case scenario of you having children at home and it's hard. What are some of the fears and what are some of the what ifs with that? The worst, the worst situation. Okay, the worst thing with that situation is that I probably would lose my job because I would be having to spend so much time trying to teach my children things that they need to learn. Mm hmm Yeah. So your focus on the teaching your kids, you're trying to do a job and you're trying to teach your kids and that's really, really hard. And so soon work goes, I don't know, you're, 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 you know, they reject you in the worst way possible. And they're like, you're fired. Okay. And then what? Well, if I don't have work, then I don't have money. And so therefore I don't have a place to live and food to eat. You lose your job and you don't have any money and you don't have a place to live or food to eat. And then what? And I would feel like I didn't, don't have anything left. So it feels terrible. 
Yes. You feel bad. Yeah. So it's not only that you, <clears throat> you lose, <clears throat> excuse me, you use food and shelter, but you're also just the suffering involved <clears throat> as well. Yeah. Okay. And then what happens? I, I feel like if I got to that point, I wouldn't know what to do. Okay. You wouldn't know what to do, you'd be lost. How long do you think you'd be lost for? Could it be forever? No. Oh, okay. Well, can you tell me then, okay, you're <laughs> lost, you don't know what to do, and then what happened? Well, I guess I would try to problem solve and see if there was something that I can do myself to get myself out of that hole, or if I could reach out to people that I know that could help me. Okay. So you'd start making some movement. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And a worst case scenario, then what happens? After I make movement? Yeah, after you make movement, then what happens? Um, that I, after I make movement, I hope that things can start getting better. Okay. So things start getting better. Use your problem solving. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So do you picture yourself and, and a lot of people do. So I want to make sure this is a very valid concern. Do you see yourself with your child next to a dumpster taking food out of it? I mean, would it get to there? I don't think it would get to there. I think I would have thoughts of that being like, that would be, I, like that would be the worst case scenario, but I don't think I would let it get there. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that even though at the beginning, your reptile brain says, I'm going to be homeless next to a dumpster and I'm going to be digging food out of it. As you're walking through this and examining it, you're saying, mm, probably not. That's Correct. how come? Um, because I already, as I was thinking about it, going down, like, the worst, you know, like, taking those steps, I already found myself thinking about what, what choices I would make. And, um, how I could potentially make the outcome better. Okay. Okay, so you, you have some problem solving skills that you can engage. Yes, I do. Okay. Have you had things in the past that have been challenging? And you've been able to overcome them because of your problem solving skills? I have, yes. Okay. I'm going to do some strengths based CBT now because it's sort of fun. Um, can you tell me a time where you've used your problem solving skills to overcome something? <laughs> um, like a like a situation? Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> um problem solving skills that could overcome a situation. Well, um, <laughs> our, our dog was, he's very feisty and he has <laughs> quite a personality. And um, 
He's, he's really fun um, and rambunctious. <laughs> so one day he just didn't eat like he usually does. And so we thought that was interesting. I kept watching him. And then um, he, he just refused to eat for days. And so we got worried and um, I would try to coerce him to eat like tasty food, like different, because we only feed kibble. And so um, I would try table food and um, treats and peanut butter and just things that he usually doesn't get. And uh, he wouldn't eat that either. So we ended up going to the vet to see if the vet could provide us some insight about what's going on, um, knowing that he would have to undergo tests to, to hopefully um, provide some information about why he's behaving differently. And then, and then we, you know, we got the report from the vet and went from there. Okay. But, so what I heard you say is that you observed your dog, you tried different ways of doing things. Instead of kibble, you offered some tasty food. And then when that didn't work, you enlisted a professional or a role model or a guide, or you asked for advice. Is that, is that about the protocol? Yeah. Do you think that process is something that you could use if you get into a situation where you lose your job? Mm. Yes. Not trying the kibble, but you know, these <laughs> trying different ways of doing things, observing, right. trying different ways of doing things and then recruiting some role models or professionals. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that. Okay, so what I'm doing, this is strengths based CBT and I'm just kind of folding it in to build some resiliency and curiosity because curiosity is really fun for people. It gets them actually excited. I've even heard people go, oh, I kind of hope the worst case scenario does happen. Um, <laughs> I, I highly doubt that somebody wants somebody to, uh, to <laughs> lose their job. But you know, I hear people go, oh, now I kind of hope I do have some sort of challenge so I can do this. Because you want to you want to get them excited and curious about what they can do because people can do way more than they think they can. Um, and so this is straight space CBT. Now you have a list that's been brought up from the back of your mind to the front of coping skills. So look at you, you got them. And they, and they didn't come from me. They came from the client, right? I like how you people have, yeah, so, so that's also a Podesky. I'm a big Podesky fan. Um, that's also from Podesky, a strengths based CBT. Um, so I want to talk about worst case scenario with health. Reason is, is especially with moms, there is a big fear of them dying or their child dying. And I will tell you, when I first started doing worst case scenario, I would go in the back of my head and be like, Oh my gosh, I hope they don't say death. I hope they don't say that they're gonna die because that's the worst. It's real, it could happen. And so what I do in these cases is I go there with them. I don't give them evidence to say, oh, that probably won't happen and things, because that's not fair, we don't know. And they're gonna be sitting in the back of their head going, you know, she's full of it, they don't know. She's not understanding me, go there and say, what would it be like? That's gonna be hard. Yeah, that would be awful. Mm -hmm. And sit with them with it. Because sometimes what happens is they've never even moved towards that thought or said it out loud and be there with them with that vulnerability. Because a lot of times when they start talking about it, it dissipates. And if not, that's okay too. 
to say, you know, is this useful right now? Is this useful? And um, there is a really good workbook by Aaron Beck and David Clark called the Worry Anxiety and Worry Workbook. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I love this book. <laughs> um, so I tell all my clients who come in with anxiety that I have generalized anxiety and panic disorder as well. It's hard. These are things that I use myself and they work. And I think that's important. That, that's a, to me, that's an appropriate self-disclosure because it's really, it's a lonely place to be when somebody's anxious about something that they think everybody else thinks they're silly for. It's really important to validate their child might die or they might die, but is it useful? And in chapter six, they talk about a pros and a cons list. And we don't have much time to go about it yet, but when you're having those thoughts, how useful is it? So CBT, in my opinion, one of the limitations at times with the way some people are trained to a CBT is, is it true or not true? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes these things are true. Is it useful or not useful? What are the pros of thinking about this all the time? What are the cons? And placing attention on a mom and what they value about their relationship with their child. You know, it's when you're thinking about death all the time or your child might die. And I don't say this to them. I do something called guided discovery so they can figure it out on their own but it takes away from the value of the relationship. It takes away from time where they can build an attachment and a healthy relationship and enjoy their time with their child. So is it useful or not useful to continue having those? And so I really wanted to hit that because that in the, when you're practicing worst case scenario, a lot of times people avoid using that because they think that's the road that somebody's gonna go down. Mm -hmm. There's another app that's kind of fun. Um, it's it's exposure and exposure is another anxiety intervention it's called We Croak. <laughs> and the app will pop up five times a day and be like, don't forget, you're going to die. And then they'll have this little, you know, some sort of Zen quote with it. And people will go, oh, my gosh, I don't think I'm going to be able to handle that. But really, it just pops up and people I haven't had one person who hasn't said after about a week of it happening, because it goes for about a month. Uh -huh. It's just like one of those calendar reminders that we always miss because we have all these notifications on our phone and they'll go, oh, okay, yeah, I'm gonna die towards the end because it's just so right, you know? And they think it's gonna be so scary every single time they see it. So it, it, it's, it helps. That's interesting, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. We croak. I love it. Yeah. All right. Earlier, um, it goes to, um, you know, when, when you're working with someone and there are some really hard feelings to just really hold that space with them. Yes. Because it is probably, um, it might, it might be the first time that they've ever been able to go there. Yes, and it's probably been in their mind and they've tried to shove it down and they've tried to avoid it. And this is a brave place. Or they've shared it before and people are like, why are you even thinking about that? That's crazy. And da 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 and discounted. So they have a fear of sharing these. Yeah. So we have some time for Q&A, and I really am curious if there's any questions or anything we can talk about. I love Q&A. This is my favorite part of trainings. <laughs> I don't see any questions right now. So hopefully if anyone has any, they could pop them up in the comment box. We would love to receive them. <laughs> 
I do want to ask you, Karen, uh, for those that are watching live right now, as well as for those that um, will be watching the recorded version as time goes on, um, if you could talk a little bit, bit about where you're at and um, how people can contact you, as well as uh, licensing requirements, because I would imagine there are going to be people from all over the country, all over the world, watching this video that may want to reach out to you for therapy and what, what the barriers or limitations are. Sure. Well, I'm licensed in California and South Dakota. Uh, now, there are some, you may know this too, Rosalie, there are some, uh, there's some movement for uh, licensing to go across states soon, no matter what license you have. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I am open for consultation and training and coaching, which I can do anywhere. Um, my website is, and I, I don't know if this is something you can share on your end, Rosalie, mm -hmm. is my website, but it's um, www.therapynsd.com, T-H-E-R-A-P-Y-I-N-S-D.com. I specialize in anxiety-based disorders and panic. Uh, so anything OCD, stress, trauma, which has a very similar response as anxiety biologically. Uh, so I work with that and I use cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not an eclectic person. I do CBT. So that's my niche. Yes, but I, I really enjoy doing trainings and supervising interns, which I can do in California and South Dakota. Uh, and I do know I have somebody who I'm supervising in India, so I, I'm not sure if internationally there's some guidelines, but there sometimes are. But um, I, I, like I said, I enjoy consulting as well. Yeah, I'm really glad that you um, highlighted that. So um, for anyone that's interested in that, accessing your therapeutic services, any of your clinical, like establishing a clinical relationship, definitely right now before the state licensing um, allows us to practice across the country, um, it would have to be residents of California and South Dakota, but um, you're such an amazing presenter and um, a teacher as well. And so for anyone that's interested in having you do any kind of consulting or teaching or presentation, you can do that anywhere. Um, you know, whether it's India or um, oh yeah, mm -hmm. or France or Brazil or Maine or New York, <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> EC, <Anywhere>. Virginia, <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it is a true pleasure and. You know, I, I encourage you to, to spread the word about these interventions and practice yourself because these are fun. Um, see it as an experiment. Um, I frame a lot of things as experiments because again, people, when they're, when they're nervous, they go black and white, pass, fail, did it right or wrong. No, it's an experiment. So try these things out yourself. See, see how they work. We all have some anxiety sometimes. You don't have to have an anxiety disorder to do these interventions. No, and thank you for reminding us of that. Um, <laughs> and what do you say for to those who um, try these interventions and it's kind of like starting a diet, you know, you're all gung-ho about it and then you're um, focused and determined, but then as time goes on or even like, if, if, if there's, if people run into challenges executing them and then um, like give up, what would you say about that? It's a couple of things I say. Um, first of all, when I give homework, I break it, I make it very simple, especially people with anxiety, they have high standards for themselves. Again, that perfectionism comes in. And um, so I'll say, just try it once, just try it once. It can be right before a session, what have you, because you don't brush your teeth. Just the only time you brush your teeth is not right before you go to the dentist. You have to do it every day. 
And so to do something every day, you, gotta, you wanna make it really easy and contained. And that's what's gonna help readjust and re um, design your neural pathways. Redesign is probably not the, not the right term, but we'll use it. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so it's a mountain of pebbles, you know, or it's walking down a path. When you, right now, say somebody's coming to you because they're like, I can't get this out of my head. I'm ruminating, ruminating, ruminating. I'm like, what if I lose my job? What if things never go back? You've been walking down that path you created a rut and you've also decorated it. So it's gonna take some time to walk another path. And the first time you walk that path, it's not, it's gonna have gopher holes, it's gonna have grass, it's gonna have all these things that get in the way. And sometimes your brain's gonna be without even noticing, forget this, I'm gonna go down the path I decorated. It's just more comfortable. So it takes some time and it's nuggets. It's a mountain of pebbles. So each time you kick a pebble over to that pile, good on you. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah. So I really, and that's one thing that I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of empathy towards incredibly busy moms, working moms with kids and, you know, just do a pebble, just do a pebble each day. 30 seconds. That's good enough. Good enough is, is key. Because a whole yeah. bunch of good enough pebbles creates a great mountain. <laughs> I love that reminder. Um, good enough, and as well as just taking 30 seconds. This doesn't have to be, you don't have to get started mm -mm. by dedicating all this time um, to, to a new practice or to a new change because it's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to find extra time. In the day. Well, and it's not particularly useful to say, I'm going to devote half an hour a day to journaling because it's going to be exhausting. And if you stop, you're, which most people would, you're, it's, you're going to feel bad about yourself. And that's silly. I mean, when we think about how we've learned to walk or read or learn the alphabet or multiply. It didn't just happen in one day. It was establishing that routine and practice, 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 practice. Yeah. That's just, that's just the way we work. That's the way we tick. Wow. I want to talk to you more about other strategies that we can um, learn from you. <laughs> You have been so fantastic and clear and very helpful today. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any comments. I'm actually, okay. I did something to the comment box, so I need to figure that out. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> Technology. <I'm> so sorry. <laughs> Girl, it's good enough. <laughs> but um, so. <laughs> I will make sure that your contact information is um, available so that anyone who watches this uh, today, tomorrow, next month, next year, whenever, is able to know how to get in touch with you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zuniga. Thank you, Karen. Have a great Friday. You too. Okay. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. I think we uh, ended. Yeah, so we're not live anymore. Awesome. Oh, okay. I see recording.